Welcome to today's webinar, a conversation with Michael Adams on the, on the diverging political cultures in Canada and the US. My name is Andrew Cardozo and I'm president of the Pearson Centre. I want to start by recognizing that the Pearson Centre is headquartered on the traditional lands of, of the Algonquin Anishinaabe peoples and we welcome our speaker and audience who are joining us from across Turtle Island. As you may know, the Pearson Centre is, is, was established nine years ago in January of 2013. We are a progressive think tank that regularly brings together a wide cross sections of Canadians from all political parties, business, labour, civil society groups, experts and just Canadians who are concerned about public policy. We always address uh, the, the challenging issues that are facing us in terms of the economy, social policy and international affairs. As we like to say, we bring people and ideas together. A special thank you to all our donors and sponsors. Many of you are here with us today, especially our sustaining sponsors who are Canada's Building Trades Unions, the International Association of Firefighters and Amapsio Ontario's Professional Employees. If you, if you like this kind of event, do visit our website, thepearsoncenter.ca and make a donation of your own so that there can be more of these thoughtful events in these turbulent times of change. Just briefly on the format, Michael Adams will take us through some fascinating slides for about 30 minutes and then I will have a few questions for him and that will be followed by questions from you, the audience. So please use the question box at the bottom of your screen and send in your questions. We'll get to as many as we can and we will end the session at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Now, Michael Adams, call him a household name or national treasure. He is a leading thinker and commentator on social norms and values across North America. You might know that he's president of the Environics Group of Research and Communication Consulting Companies, which he co-founded in 1970. In 2006, he founded the the Environics Institute for Survey Research, where he serves as president. Michael is also the author of six books, including Sex in the Snow, Canadian Social Values at the End of the Millennium, Fire and Ice, the United States, Canada, and the Myth of Converging Values, which is very much a discussion today, and Unlikely Utopia, the Surprising Triumph of Canadian Pluralism. I'm going to stop right there. Michael Adams, it's a tremendous pleasure to welcome you to the Pearson podium. Over to you. Well, thank you, Andrew, for that kind introduction. And it's so great to be, you know, at an event sponsored by the Pearson Center uh, today. Um, turbulent times, for sure. Uh, it's uh, uh, unsettling times for all of us and for Canadians today, and particularly Canadians who uh, live in Ottawa. And, a few of us in Toronto as well. Um, I'm, I'm going to, as, as you've said, I'm going to spend about half an hour just kind of going through a few slides. Um, I told you five, and then I've come up with, I think, 17 or 18. I'll try to keep within my time, but essentially it's going to be an overview of what we find doing survey research in Canada and the United States, which we've been doing for uh, a, a number of decades, actually. So why don't we get right into it so we can get into the conversation with you and other members of the audience. And uh, I hope uh, everybody learns something, maybe including me. So um, let's get this. Okay. All right. Okay. Now we just need to get this going. Oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, the U.S. and Canada have always been distinct cultures since the outset of each of our nations, um, and we've been on unique socio-cultural trajectories. Uh, the Americans are, and again, this has either been proven in history or, or in some cases, just uh, some stereotypes. But uh, Americans are more risk-taking. Uh, we are a more risk-averse culture. Uh, they're a culture of aspiration. We're a, a culture of a mutual accommodation. Uh, interestingly, we started out more religious, but today 
it's the Americans who are more religious and we are more secular. Uh, again, in America, money is everything. Uh, here, money is suspect. Uh, they are bragging the highest standard of living in the world. We brag the best quality of life or certainly among the very top. Uh, a winner take all culture in the United States. We tend toward income redistribution. Uh, Americans uh, believe that they will win the lottery in their pursuit of happiness. We think we're in Canada, we've already won the lottery. Uh, this is a bit of a joke on my part. Americans believe in capricious philanthropy, that is getting in line and making sure that Bill and Melinda Gates uh, recognize your charity and are going to be generous to you. Uh, our philanthropy is compulsory. It's known as taxation, and we have a federal government that does that and then spreads it around the rest of the country through programs like equalization and so on. Uh, their humor is more put-down humor, uh, everything from the Three Stooges to on up. Uh, and uh, we've inherited the British tradition of, of self-effacing irony. Uh, we say the opposite of what we mean and hope... Uh, Hope that people get our jokes. In America, calling somebody a liberal is an epithet. In in our country, it's it's normative, and indeed we have a political party that seems to dominate that's able to have the label liberal. Uh, that would be impossible in the United States. So, what's our methodology? We have a program that tracks people's personal values, motivations, and their mindsets, how they look at the world and make sense of it. Uh, in, our, in our interviews with people, um, we use a multiple statements that measure an aspect of a social value. Um, this work has been done in Canada since 1983, and in the US, we started it in 1992 and continue in both countries up until today. Um, the latest research that I'll be presenting was collected in 2020 in the US, 2021 in Canada, 60 values are tracked uh, using more than 150 items or questions or statements that we put to a, a random sample of people. Uh, and we use very large samples of 5,000 or more in each of the countries. So it's representative and very large and the large allows us to break it down into subgroups. So, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, he has no values. Uh, um, but actually everybody has values. You just may not like the values of the other person. And these are examples of the kinds of values that we have been tracking over these decades. Uh, acceptance of violence, adaptability to complexity, the American dream, everybody knows what that is. Uh, the authoritarian impulse, uh, conspiracism is a new one we've been adding, a belief that there are conspiracies all around us. Uh, flexible families, uh, in other words, Adam and Steve, as well as Adam and Eve, um, global consciousness, um, ostentatious consumption, a penchant for risk, religiosity, sexism, uh, xenophobia. We are A to X. We don't have a Z yet. Anybody who has a, a trend that they think we should be tracking that starts with Z, we'd be, give us a, an email and we'll, uh, we'll start being A to Z. When we do our surveys and add up all the results for everybody, we create a, a map, a sociocultural map with four quadrants. And north-south, we're looking at people in the, at the north of the map we'd find up there who are deferential to traditional authority at the people at the bottom are people who question or, or reject traditional authority. And the east-west axis is one in which at the left-hand side, People are oriented to survival of the fittest, kind of a, a, Darwin, a Darwinian or Hobbesian state of nature, nasty, brutish, and short. And over on the right-hand side, people who are oriented to fulfillment. They have post-modern, post-material values. That gives us four quadrants. The upper left quadrant are people who are oriented to status and security. They obey, obey traditional norms and structures. Uh, uh, the upper right are people who are oriented to authenticity and responsibility, well-being, harmony, and responsibility are the, are the core of their mental posture. In the lower right-hand quadrant, we have people who are oriented to fulfillment and, and individuality, 
And the mental posture of, of these people is idealism. There can be a better world. They are autonomous and they're into exploration and flexibility. And the lower left quadrant are individualistic as well. But again, their world is, is more of a survival of the fittest world. They feel excluded from the mainstream. Uh, they're oriented to intensity, uh, you know, feeling the lifeblood going through their veins. They seek stimulus and attention. So those are the four quadrants of, of mental posture. Uh, when we look at the two cultures, and this is again from 35,000 feet, when we first began uh, in the United States, the average American, when we did an average of everybody in our survey, uh, was found in uh, just inside the authenticity and responsibility quadrant. The Canadians, we found, were also over on the fulfillment side of our map, but they were down and more of them were found in the idealism and autonomy. Uh, quadrant. Uh, so then in, if we just jump to 2020 in the US, uh, we find the average American is moving away from traditional authority down towards individuality, but is also being pulled to the survival side of the axis and into the exclusion and intensity quadrant. The average Canadian at a similar time, or just a few months later in 2021, we find deeper, uh, also going away from traditional authority, but staying in the idealism and autonomy quadrant and moving a little bit uh, toward the more toward the fulfillment part of the uh, axis. Uh, and there is an example then of the Canadians. And we're actually, as you can see from 1992, we were a little closer. And then in 2020 and 2021, we're actually getting further apart. And that, of course, leads us to look at uh, why are we continuing on a divergent path? So on which values do Canadians and Americans differ the most in 2020, 2021? Well, the Canadians, when they're in terms of comparing to the average American in terms of social values, Canadians are stronger on doing their duty. They're stronger on rejection of authority or questioning authority, stronger on flexible families, again, gay, straight, and, and so on, blended families, uh, strong on post-material mindsets, uh, saving on principle, and discriminating consumerism. These are mental postures that differentiate Canadians from, from Americans. Americans, on the other hand, are when compared to Canadians are stronger on religiosity, stronger on patriarchy, that is father is master in the house, um, uh, stronger on traditional family, mom and dad, you know, Adam and Eve, uh, father knows best, confidence in, in big business, a need for status recognition and ostentatious consumption, which is obviously the opposite of discriminating consumerism. So again, these are the values that most differentiate the two cultures. And let's look at, you know, the, the item that uh, is probably my favorite because of course it, me it is a measure of the hierarchy of in, in the fundamental institution. Um, the first one we meet is the family. It's the fundamental institution of society. And the measure of the structure of authority in the family, we measure that by asking people to agree or disagree strongly or somewhat uh, with the statement, uh, father of the family must be master in his own house. Well, in 1992, <clears throat> in the US, it was 42%. And in that year, when we measured the same thing in Canada, it was 25% which we thought, boy, that's a significant difference. We didn't really know that it would be different. We thought it would be similar on each side. We had feminism as movements in each side of the, of the border and so on, but it was interesting that in 1992. Now, I did present this and somebody said, well, that's just one survey, do another one and see how it goes. So four years later, and you can see these are all presidential election years. In the US, up to 44% in 1996, Canada, uh, patriarchy is further eroding down to 20%. So we have two observations to really get a sense of whether or not we are going in a systematic direction. Um, 
up to 48% in the year 2000. And in Canada, we're now down at 18%. So with that information, that allows me then to write books like Sex in the Snow, uh, which was a book about social values in Canada. It was not my autobiography, for sure. Um, and then uh, with this, I said, okay, I've got to do a book about Canada, US, and that led to the book Fire and Ice. So 2004, uh, we're up to 52% in the United States. Canada then is at 21. And moving right along, you can see that it, it does dip a bit. 2012 um, in the United States, it's at a, a, it had gone down. Of course, Obama is the president of the United States, uh, the first Canadian president of the United States, actually. Uh, Canada is now in the you know, 21, 23, 24, 24%, about half of the US. Uh, it's up a bit from 2000. And we, of course, say this is a reflection of immigration to Canada with a lot of people coming from patriarchal countries, a lot of them religious patriarchal countries. And so that gives you a kind of a portrait then of the orientation to patriarchy. Uh, this one then looks at, breaks it down by men and women in each country. So in the US, 58% of men think father must be master in the family versus 41% of women. In Canada, 32% of men think father must be master of the house. It's actually a lower percent than women in the United States. And 16% of Canadian women believe the father must be master in the house. If we look by, at religious denomination, and the reason we look at that is because we think that religious ideology or religious belief is probably, or should be, theoretically, as strong, if not stronger, than your national identity or the values that you get by living in your own country. So here's where we find conservative Protestants in the United States in the status and security uh, quadrant. Mainline American Protestants are in the authenticity of responsibility, but first up the map. Catholics in the US, other non, other non Christians like Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists and, uh, and, and so on, um, Sikhs are uh, further down the map. And then people with no religion are down here in the idealism and aqua, uh, autonomy quadrant. If we look at the Canadians, conservative Protestants in Canada are quite distinct and are actually in the, in the idealism and autonomy quadrant. These are born again Christians or evangelicals and so on. Um, and you would think if there was any group that's going to be in Canada, that's going to be like their American cousins or co-religionists, it would be uh, conservative Protestants, but actually they are, um, they're, they're influenced much more by, by being Canadian uh, in terms of their social values than their uh, evangelical or born again orientation. Mainline Protestants in Canada, further down the map, Catholics, very similar to mainline Protestants, very interesting uh, finding here. Uh, other non-Christians, again, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, and so on, further down the map. And then people with no religion are almost off the map in Canada. Uh, it looks like really the only Americans who would feel comfortable as in terms of religion uh, in Canada would be those with no religion, Americans with no religion, or those who are other non-Christian uh, religions would uh, seemingly feel comfortable being, uh, being in Canada. Uh, so here we look at attitudes between the two country and countries, and they do reflect, you'll see, uh, the basic value orientations of people in each country. So this is, it looks at people who agree that their country is in a state of moral collapse. And 75% of Americans believe this. In Canada, it's 47%. It's still a very high number. But of course, it's quite a significant difference from Americans. Those who think things are going right in their country, only 28% of Americans versus uh, a, a majority of Canadians uh, that think their country is on the edge of bankruptcy, 60% of Americans versus 40% of Canadians. Uh, abortion should be safe and legal, 60, two thirds of Americans and 81% of Canadians. Uh, that Black Lives Matter movement is bad for their country, 
46% of Americans, of course, that's where the Black Lives Matter movement began, and only 31% of Canadians think uh, Black Lives Matter is bad for Canada. Uh, and finally, that most so-called theory, uh, conspiracy theories you read about are true. 33% uh, of Americans believe that and only 19% of Canadians. So it shows that opinions and attitudes are a reflection of the deeper values in each culture. So in, in 2020, Canadians' favorable opinion of the U.S. is at the lowest level for almost 40 years. This is a question we've been posing since 1982 when Ronald Reagan was in power. And uh, our view of America in 1982, when we first measured it, 72% had a positive opinion about the United States, not just as politics, but of you know the country that gives us uh, great professional sports and movies out of Hollywood and TV out of New York and uh, great technological uh, gadgets that uh, we use then. In those days, it would have been a personal computer. But as you can see over time, that began to collapse and it really started to collapse uh, after 2000, the election of George Bush um, Jr. And, uh, and then of course the, uh, the war in Iraq and uh, Canada not joining the coalition of the willing. And by the time we get into the middle part of the, um, of the 2000s, uh, Canadians were not at 72 to 17, but were split 50-50. Americans then elect Obama. We come, become uh, more positive about the United States. Of course, then we get Donald Trump and everything sinks down to the point where 29, only 29% of Canadians had a positive view of the United States with Trump in power. With the election of Joe Biden, we're kind of back to a 50-50 country of favorable and unfavorable views. Two thirds of Canadians typically have a preference uh, for the Democratic Party, although this is interesting, if you look at this, this is uh, being Democrat versus vote, uh, if we were given a chance to vote in the in the U.S., uh, some of us would probably choose to vote there because our votes <laughs> might might affect their elections. But you know, in 1988, we were between uh, Dukakis and and George Bush. It was kind of 33, 31. Uh, we actually in 1992 uh, uh, were more likely to support. George uh, Bush um, than uh, than Bill Clinton, um, and then uh, and then by the time of the mid and in the 1996 re-election of Bill Clinton, uh, we were overwhelmingly for Clinton, and now we've been really uh, uh, leaning much more Democrat Gore. We were uh, over uh, George W. Bush 48 to 29, and then uh, now we've been you know in, in the last 20 years it's overwhelming majority uh, and in the 2020 election 67 percent of us would have voted democrat and uh, only 15 percent for trump now you'd say well 15 percent that's a you know a pretty substantial um a proportion of canadians uh who would have who would have voted for trump if you look at it by region um and this is a this looks at all the states in the united states and all the provinces in canada uh Canadians would have preferred uh, Biden um, in more than any U.S. state. The only place in the United States is the District of Columbia that's more Canadian than Canada. But you can see that Quebec and Ontario, B.C., uh, all, all uh, were overwhelmingly voting for, uh, would have voted for, and even in Alberta, um, it would have been, you know, among uh, very uh, Biden, pro-Biden states. And that's with you know Trump saying he he would keep the Keystone uh, pipeline and Biden saying he was going to get rid of it. Even then, uh, the majority in uh, in Alberta was would have voted Democrat, would have voted for Biden. So we look. This is a very interesting thing. We asked about political ideology. Do you feel are you in the left or the right, and how far left and how far right? Uh, liberal or conservative, we use liberal and conservative in the US, we do left and right in Canada because you can't do liberal and conservative, those are political parties here. And this shows the distribution of people in self-identifying as being on the left or on the right. So on the extreme left, only 4% of us say we're on the extreme left in this country, and only 4% of us say that we're on the extreme right in the country. 
and we see that the uh, the uh, plurality then find themselves right in the middle of the map. Of course, that's where you expect a Canadian to go. Why does a Canadian cross the road? Is to get in the middle, and that's where Canadians find themselves ideologically. Uh, and that is not true in the United States, and it's becoming even more so. 12% of Americans feel they're on the far left, 17% are on the far right, and uh, about half the proportion as we get in Canada are, are find themselves right in the middle of the spectrum. Uh, this is interesting because then you look at the ideological uh, composition of, uh, of, of conservative and uh, of, of, of supporters of the political parties. So you look at, and obviously uh, the ideological orientation of conservatives is, is of great interest to us now because we're going to be going into another conservative leadership convention. 62, no, only 3% of conservatives say they're on the left. The majority say they're in the center, which is where Aaron O'Toole was appealing. And 35% say they're on the right. But with the Republican party, 85% are on the right. And of course that's what's happening is the right is dominating the Republican party. Uh, liberal voters, as you'd expect, about 21% are on the left, 63% on the, in the center and 16% on the right. So it's it's got, the entire spectrum is reflected with the Liberals, and it's, that's kind of similar uh, to the um, independents in the United States. New Democrats, as you'd expect, about a third on the left, although, again, even the majority of New Democrats uh, say they're in the center. Uh, and with the, with the Democrats in the United, uh, NDP voters, in the Democrats, 60% uh, consider themselves on the left or liberal, 35% in the center or moderates. So a much more ideological uh, orientation uh, and, and sorting of the parties by ideology in the United States as in Canada. Um, finally, those values then uh, are reflected in the degree to which people are actually satisfied with their political system. So these are Canadians who are satisfied with the political system in, in this country. It's stayed about the same since, you know, over the last decade. Um, Americans were satisfied. It's, a, you know, it's, it's the majority, but it's about 20 points consistently, 20 points less than in Canada. Dissatisfied uh, in Canada is only 26%, but dissatisfied in the United States, it rivals those who are satisfied. It's nearly half uh, the, um, the population that's dissatisfied with the political system, including being dissatisfied with the electoral system and that, in fact, elections are fair in their country. Uh, we have similar kinds of findings, even with the belief that the democracy, the electoral cornerstone of our democracy is fair in each country. And then finally, just uh, how these mental postures or orientations uh, are affecting you know, the way we're we're behaving in, in terms of, uh, of, the, of the pandemic and getting vaccinated. 64% uh, uh, of the American population have uh, uh, fully vaccinated, that's two, uh, two shots. And in Canada, 84%, which is a significantly higher uh, proportion of the population. So further reading, there's my book, Fire and Ice, which, uh, uh, and I think there's, uh, an addition that I did uh, seven or eight years after I initially published in 2003 that updates Fire and Ice, American Backlash. I wrote a book about the United States in 2006, a very long time ago. Uh, maybe I was ahead of the curve on that. And then I wrote, Could It Happen Here? And that was a book uh, after uh, Trump was elected and after Brexit in Britain and the populism we saw in Europe. Um, and then coming up in a few Months will be a chapter in the Canada and the United States book, Differences That Count. It's the fifth edition. Um, I expect this is, although it's an academic book, could turn out to be a bestseller. And uh, then there was the article that I wrote that inspired Andrew to invite me to this podcast on January the 1st. I did an article, Stephen March did an article uh, predicting the coming civil war in the United States. Thomas Homer Dixon wrote, uh, a very pessimistic article on the direction in the United States. And uh, that's uh, for those who want to read what uh, 
um, what I've been saying over these last 20 years, and I now look forward to uh, to Andrew and uh, hearing from the rest of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, that was that was totally fascinating, as uh, as we expected. I have. Uh, I just want to say to the audience, I've got a few questions to start with. Uh, some of them have, in fact, come in from you. Uh, but please send in your questions, and we'll ask them as we go through the next uh, the next half hour. And we will wrap up at uh, at 3 p.m. Uh, Central uh, so Eastern Time. Um, so, Michael, I, I thought the the um, the slide you had on on the centrists in Canada and the U.S. was quite instructive. And let me ask you about the U.S. first. The the talk out of the U.S. is that there is no center left, uh, no center uh, existing anymore. Um, and therefore, the parties go for the right and the left. But what you're finding is that there is quite a quite a center that the Republicans have, by and large, um, vacated, but is still open to the Democrats. Is, yeah, I, I, is, you know, uh, Biden is kind of uh, conflicted between the the left of his party, who say, "Look, we're in power now. It's time, you know, that we did electoral reform, and you know, why don't we give? It's time to give." Uh, uh, Canada, uh, the gift of Canada to the United States, and uh, and uh, you know certainly the pandemic has given Biden uh, an opportunity to uh, to have more state activism, but you know he's got a very narrow, uh, well, a, a one vote majority in the in the Senate, so it's it's pretty tough for him. And uh, whereas the, with the Republicans, essentially, they've been, uh, you know, the tail is wagging the dog. The, the Trumpists seem to have taken over uh, uh, the party. And they, and they do this, you know, partly by the, uh, the primaries, uh, the mo have the most extreme people who win the party nomination. And, uh, and so you've got kind of a 50-50 country there. And it, therefore, it, it depends on turnout. And, of course, we'll see this. Coming up, can the Democrats get a turnout rate in their midterms uh, later this year uh, at the same level as they did uh, in the presidential election? But typically, actually, turnout uh, goes down, and everybody's predicting, uh, given the odds, that the uh, that the Republicans will uh, get control of the House and may even get control of the Senate. And then you're going to have kind of a lame duck uh, Biden uh, trying to govern his country and get Supreme Court justices accepted and, and all sorts of things. So a lot of people are kind of predicting that they're going to be in kind of a stalemate from the midterms till the next presidential election. And then the question is, who is going to be the candidate for uh, uh, the Republican Party? Is it Trump or someone else? Uh, and, and will Biden run again or will he uh, pull back and let the Democrats uh, see if they can come up with somebody who is uh, more appealing to the Americans? Yeah. Um, so, so let me ask you about the Canadian part of that slide. I think it's the next slide I'm I'm thinking about. Um, and as we look at the uh, at the Conservative Party looking for a new leader, uh, I'm looking at those numbers there, and um, there's still the the centrist in the Conservative Party are you've got them at 62 versus about 32 for the more conservative-minded folks. Um, is it the same kind of thing for the conservatives uh, in Canada as as you said about the Republicans that that the the conservative base is the one that drives what happens in the party and in well, a sense mm -hmm. yeah we'll so, so, uh, what are your thoughts yeah I mean it, it they may go that direction I mean it was interesting that Aaron O'Toole kind of got elected beat uh, uh, Peter McKay uh, by appealing to the right of the party by the more libertarian, the more social conservative, the more religious people, people motivated uh, by the issue of abortion or the death penalty or conversion therapy and all of these values issues. Um, and, uh, but then when O'Toole decided, okay, now I'm, I'm the leader, uh, I've got the conservative people in the more, the more right-wing people in my coalition, now to reach out to the moderates in Canada and the moderate conservatives and multicultural Canada, I've got to have a more centrist uh, point uh, uh, perspective. So he had a pretty activist uh, agenda. 
uh, appealing to working class Canadians uh, from a conservative. That was something unique. Um, coming up with a, a policy that was uh, uh, con confronting uh, global warming and so on. So he, he kind of moved the party, but he didn't um, he didn't defeat the liberals. He got you know they got a higher popular vote, but he wasn't able to defeat the liberals. So now I think there it'll be up to the conservatives to decide: do they want to? Uh, are they going to choose somebody who has a stronger appeal to the um, to the right in the party, and um, and then uh, in order to uh, take on the what the five to ten percent of us who are now leaning toward the People's Party of Canada, which is sort of our Trump party here. So uh, it'll be fascinating to see what kind of a conversation the Conservatives have if they choose somebody who is, you know, more uh, a more to the right. Um, and who adopts a lot of the attitudes of people on the right, they're going to lose people in that 62%, uh, the, the people who are in the center. And uh, that is going to be a very happy day for the Liberal Party of Canada and even the New Democrats. And can you say a little more about the, the People's Party and how, how you're finding them in terms of public opinion and the, the effect that they're having on that group you talked about in the Conservative Party? Are, are they eating up too much of their support? Well, the thing is, they started out in, in 2019 with, what, 1.6% of the vote, and Max Bernier did not get elected to Parliament. Um, then on the, with, with his, the, his sales were filled with the winds of the pandemic. That right. vaulted him from 1.6% to nearly 5% of the popular vote. And again, given our first-past-the-post system, uh, he wasn't able to get elected anywhere in in the country, and again, not even in his own riding. Uh, but now, with uh, this, with this rising, there's a rising, you know, fatigue. With uh, obviously, and you're seeing the effects of that, and with the, the truckers in, in Ottawa, the, a rising fatigue with with the pandemic and with the mandates uh, and the restrictions and so on. So a lot of people want to get rid of all of this stuff. But the vast majority of Canadians are saying, uh, yeah, I want to, we want to get rid of it, but we've got to do it in a thoughtful way. We just don't want to get rid of all of it. It has to be done on the basis of science and what medical people tell us and, uh, who we, and the politicians who should be listening to those medical uh, people. And, uh, and so, you know, we're, we've got, you know, around, uh, he could go, I guess you'd say, if, if the current mood that we have in Canada today uh, we have, you know, in a year and a half or two or three or whatever it's going to be with the next election, you know, the People's Party could find themselves up to, uh, you know, 10 percent. Uh, at that level, they are going to elect people into Parliament. But who knows, you know, certainly, you, I don't know anyone who's so pessimistic that doesn't think that the pandemic will be endemic in a couple of years. So then the People's Party is going to have to find something else that the Canadians are really upset about. And if the Conservatives choose a more right-wing leader, um, and they may do it in order to eat into the support that uh, the People's Party is getting, um, you know, we will have more ideological uh, politics in, uh, in Canada. Um, you know, uh, and, and the question is then, who, who are the people who've been successful as Conservative leaders? Well, Brian Mulroney sure was, won two majorities in a row. Stephen Harper was our prime minister for 10 years. He was able to appeal to the people on the right, but he didn't give them much red meat once he was prime minister. So we'll see what kind of a leader uh, the Conservatives choose. Yeah, um, let, let me um, move to some of the, or sort of move a little bit from, from this part to a number of questions that are coming in with regards to the, the occupations happening in Ottawa, Coots, Alberta. Um, it seems like Winnipeg. There were weekend demonstrations in in Toronto and and Quebec City. Um, is that American style of angry uh, populist politics coming to Canada in a noticeable way now? I think it is noticeable. Yes, <laughs> it's a. Um, I guess you'd say this is our January the sixth. Is the truckers in Ottawa? Um, 
uh, with avowedly their idea was they get together with the governor general. I don't know. They were this was not the comedy channel. I think they were sincere. They they were going to get together with the governor general and you know replace the government. Uh, now they've done it. Their weapon uh, their weapons are trucks, not uh, guns and knives and sticks and so on. Uh, but uh, you know this this is evidence of of an extremism. Um, and it violates the peace order and good government. Uh, ironically, they came to get rid of Trudeau, but they ended up getting rid of uh, O'Toole. Um, and now we Canadians, in our own Canadian way, are trying to figure out um, how do we get them to go back home. Um, I think as time is going on, the sympathy that a lot of Canadians had for what they thought were truckers who were saying it's time to get rid of the mandate you know the the mandates and the and the restrictions uh, that it looks like you know that that uh, the omicron ver uh, is is in decline. Um, but I think their tactics and and the suffering they're uh, inflicting on the people, the innocent people of Ottawa, especially seniors who live around you know the downtown area, uh, and the ridiculous request to you know to change uh, the insurrection to change the government. I think they've actually not done themselves any good, and they're probably still stuck with you know that 10% who, in our research and the research of other uh, uh, survey researchers, uh, shows about 10% who are either anti-vax or highly hesitant. Well, that's 10%. It's a lot of people. 10% of 38 million is you know nearly 4 million people. That's a significant number. Now, thank heaven, 4 million people didn't show up in Ottawa to show their uh, uh, concern, but there, you know, again, there was a lot of sympathy, but I think they've lost their sympathy as time has gone on. And people say, you've made your point, go back home and uh, and let's listen to what the, the prime minister and the premiers are going to say in terms of uh, eventually, thoughtfully getting rid of the restrictions. Uh, let, let me ask you this question that, that's come in from, the, from a member of the audience. Um, and I'll paraphrase it. For the past uh, 60 years, there have been virtually no objections to vaccines against smallpox, polio, and measles. What is the reason for the recent uh, distrust of, of science? Well, again, when we survey the Canadians, uh, we find the vast majority are uh, in favor of science and are in favor of getting shots. Um, I guess we haven't, you know, we haven't had a pandemic we've got uh, you know a lot of the vaccines i guess uh, are given to the kids in school i guess each of us can look on our left arm and find that we you know we've we've, we've had uh, we get vaccinated against various things uh, there are parents for religious reasons or other reasons who uh, object to this and um, and I, I imagine that there's some sort of reasonable accommodation uh, but here we've got a pandemic where it's obvious that if you don't get vaccinated, you've got a very good chance of giving it to your spouse or your your kids or people you bump into. And uh, but uh, I, I imagine that we've always had, you know, a proportion of the Canadians, 10 percent or so, who uh, who have who have not uh, like. Vaccinated and uh, but, you know, if. If you're going to travel abroad, um, you're going to find that you've got to get vaccinated or you're not going to take that trip. Maybe these are people in who don't travel outside the country um, and uh, and don't have to, you know, abide by the uh, the rules on international travel. And anybody who's been to Southeast Asia and so on knows you've got to have shots against tetanus and all sorts of other things, malaria and so on. It's just a requirement. So if, if you're not going to abide by it, you don't take the trip. And so I imagine there is that small proportion of Canadians who uh, uh, avoid the uh, the mandates uh, for being vaccinated against COVID or, or other other things that we've been vaccinating ourselves against for a hundred years. Yeah. So so this international point is really interesting. And and as you may know, the there's been speculation at this point. I don't know how much proof we have that some of the nine million dollars that the occupiers in Ottawa raised came from outside sources, American sources and other places. And it could be, you know, mischief being played by other governments who want to be mischievous with our with our politics. Uh, Russia comes to mind. China is often mentioned in this context. Um, what do you think is happening? A, um, well, 
nefariously, where, where a government like Russia may try to influence our politics, or more straightforwardly, where conservative forces or populist forces in America are trying to influence our politics. What's your sense of how much of that is happening? I, I think it's happening. Um, <clears throat> I think I think it's the Chinese, the Russians, uh, and Americans on the right uh, are um, are all in their own way. Whether it's you know digital and online and and uh, QAnon and all that sort of thing. I mean, we are next door to the United States. <laughs> we're we're inundated with American culture, popular culture. A lot of it's just entertaining, but we're inundated also with the American news. And uh, it's daily, uh, and, and uh, so we're bound to be uh, influenced by uh, the rise of, uh, of, of, of Trumpism, of uh, conspiracism, of uh, fake news, and all of that in, in the United States. The, 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 you know, people say, you know, if it, if it ha if can happen there, it happens here. Anything that happens in the United States does happen in Canada. Right. So but the scale here is much less than it is in the United States. And it's just not on this populism. It's on other things like guns. Uh, America, you know, ten, uh, when it comes to gun violence in the United States, it's you know, there are 10 deaths every year for every 100,000 people. That's not a lot, but it's still 10 to uh, 10 people versus Canada, where it's it's two people. Uh, versus 10 in the United States, two per 100,000. So again, death by uh, guns in the United States is five times higher than it is in Canada. Well, we're next door to the US, so there's a lot of illegal guns in this country. So we have a higher rate of death by guns, uh, either by homicide or suicide, than do the Danes. Um, but I think we do pretty well um, at keeping it as low as we do. Chicago, is 800 deaths a year by uh, guns. Uh, can, uh, Toronto, a, a city of similar size, uh, you know, has 80,000, 80, not 800,000. The rate is 10 times higher in Chicago than it is in, 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 uh, in Toronto. Now, yes, we do have deaths in Toronto by guns, but the rate is infinitely. So yes, what happens in the United States does happen here the scale is infinitely less, and I think that is true on a lot of a lot of the measures, uh, including measures like faith in democracy, faith in elections, uh, and so on. We do see uh, uh, the two cultures are independent tra trajectories of sociocultural change, and um, in 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 some respects, the U.S. for Canada is a country they do admire for many of their great qualities, but a lot of Canadians say, I'm, it's nice to be next door, wonderful to go down to Florida in the winter and be a snowbird, but thank God I live in Canada. Yeah, I, 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 I'm picking up a bit of disconcerting thought from some of my friends who are on the far right in Canada who are despi being despising of elections, but I think it's more evident in the US, and uh, I'd like your thoughts, and whether people on the far right and even the Republicans are losing faith in democracy because in a sense they feel the wrong people are voting. All the kind of uh, limitations they're putting on, in place are to prevent black people from voting. So they kind of, there is a belief that goes back to white supremacist uh, America where they didn't want black people to vote and now they've got black people voting and they're going, yeah, they're voting the wrong way, we should stop them from voting. Or in other words, democracy isn't so good, maybe, January the 6th is a way to go. Forget about democracy. We've got to assert our way. Am, am I making this up? Well, yeah. Then, and if I had to have a, an elevator version of, you know, why is Canada so different from the United States? I mean, one of the, I think the top thing, and there are not a lot of values differences and geography, and they're a superpower and we're a middle power and all of that sort of thing. But you, on this issue of race, of course, the, uh, the huge point is this, uh, America was put together as a coalition between the South that wanted to keep the peculiar institution of slavery as a cornerstone of its economy and a deal with the North who said, okay, if we're gonna have a country that's united all these 13 colonies, 
then we're going to have to allow slavery to continue. And that was, and, and you, their first presidents had slaves, uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and so on. Um, Canada has, as been pointed out, had slavery, but we did not have a slave economy. It's some academic articles I've read have said that we have had as many as 1,500 slaves in Canada. In, in, in Halifax, in Montreal, Toronto, and so on. But the huge difference is, is we didn't bake in slavery. And of course, the British Empire got rid of it in 1832. Uh, John Gray Simcoe, even in the 1790s, abolished uh, slavery in Upper Canada. So we have, a, we have a different tradition here when it comes on, on that issue of, of, of black, white, anti-black slavery. And of course, then the Americans had their civil war. They killed 700,000 people, you know, trying to keep the country together and freeing the slaves and so on. Then you have Reconstruction and then Jim Crow. All of these things are in the history of the United States and they live with us today. And uh, the, Amer the Democrat coalition includes black people, uh, a lot of multicultural people, a lot of liberal type of people and so on. And unfortunately, the Republican coalition is essentially people who are a backlash, as I said in my book, American Backlash, against the progressivism that started in the 1960s with the Voter Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, and then affirmative action and, and busing and all of that sort of thing. And America, and of course, Reagan was the first one to benefit from the backlash, but it continues all the way through, uh, really from Reagan all the way up to the most extreme anti, uh, you know, white backlash, uh, the white, older white men feeling that their identity is being eclipsed, is being threatened by, uh, again, by the, by the equality that uh, black people are demanding, uh, other factors of social change in the United States that Americans, American Republicans don't like is the relative decline of religion. And of course, they really don't like um, gender equality. And, the, uh, and you can see that patriarchy is one of, the, uh, uh, one of the core values of Republicans, uh, and it's trying to reassert the traditional authority of the male in the family, the father who's going to be the master. Uh, in the, uh, and, and those values, when you put them all together, lead to what we call the authoritarian reflex or the authoritarian personality. And right. so you've got that as a as a as a kind of a huge ideological uh, division with America split, you know, kind of 50-50. And is that and is does Donald Trump fit that bill of the authoritarian personality so perfectly? Perfectly. I mean, he was, you know, as as my cousins in Michigan told me, Michael, <laughs> he's saying what we're thinking. And yeah. uh, and of course, that was when I stopped talking about politics <laughs> on the beach of Lake Michigan. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the divisions uh, are, are so deep and becoming deeper. Uh, and uh, what Biden is trying to do is to show that the state can be a positive force in the United States, that it can protect people when it comes to a pandemic, uh, that it can help people, that, that the state can be activist again and, and have public infrastructure spending that the United States needs and so on. And I'm uh, sadly, um, you know, we're kind of a two to one country and they're a 50 50 country and uh, our two to one country gives a big advantage. The two being, you know, the parties on the left, the liberals and the, and the NDP. Uh, and um, so it takes a really unpopular liberal government uh, to and it will happen uh, where people say we're going to throw the scoundrels out and put in the conservatives. It'd be very interesting to see when they do get tired of those liberals. Uh, what kind of a conservative party we have and what kind of a conservative leader we have. Uh, so but uh, is that 50-50 that, that and therefore it's, uh, uh, and so you're seeing incredible efforts by Republicans uh, to uh, do again, it's kind of Jim Crow again, you know, where you have uh, poll taxes and other methods of suppressing the vote of minorities and particularly of black people. Um, and these fights are and gerrymandering and, and voter suppression. These things are all going on now in all of the states uh, of the United States. The Democrat states are even 
uh, well, they're trying to open things up to make it easier for everybody to vote. Uh, the Republicans are trying to make it harder for people to vote, particularly people who would vote Democrat. Um, Michael, this is so much fun and we're running out of time. I have a couple of questions I want to just uh, squeeze in here. Um, and I, I wonder if I, <laughs> I'll ask you to, be, to give short answers, although your, your answer <laughs> is just wonderful. I, I don't want to be cutting you off. Um, in, in terms of this, this two to one in Canada, what's your message to uh, progressives in Canada, to liberals or new Democrats? Um, can they rest on their laurels or what are the chances that they do rest too much on their laurels? And, and um, we end up with a, a very strong far right uh, conservative party in power at some point in the future. Um, I think among the baby boomers and elders, so we're talking about, you know, people, majority of us now, um, they're pretty well baked in in terms of their partisan pre uh, predilections. So I, I think the real battle is going to be the battle for the younger voters. And uh, the direction that I see, uh, and it's also in the United States, is that you, uh, that the, the younger people are getting uh, generally, they're tilting more towards things like gender equality, uh, racial and ethnic equality, you know, inclusion, diversity, um, the diversity, the sexual orientations, and so on. So the the, the, uh, the 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 trajectory of social change in Canada is more toward liberal, open tolerance for other. We have not diminished in our desire to have a lot of immigration coming to the country, nearly 1% of our population, 400,000 people. We are open as we were with the boat people and then the Syrians and now the Afghan people to bringing in refugees in Canada. So the direction of social change is more open, tolerant and progressive. And I would imagine that this is gonna make it a bit of a challenge then for actually people on the right uh, more of a challenge because uh, there is a um, the direction of social change is more toward a progressive orientation. We we haven't talked about uh, climate, Michael, but just just in a few seconds, what are your thoughts about uh, the future of climate policy and how they're supported in the two countries? Yeah, I mean it's overwhelming uh, numbers of us believe that the climate change is is anthropogenic. It's something that that humans have done. They by the rapid industrial development over the last 200 years, we've given our, we've changed the climate. We humans have changed the climate, therefore we humans better come up with solutions to it. So that is something that every party must take seriously. Now, whether or not we need a carbon tax, as the liberals have given us, uh, you know, they thought that was a big, pretty big risk, but Trudeau got elected. Uh, and that was actually one of the things that helped him get elected. But it doesn't mean that the conservatives would say, well, no, not a carbon tax. We need to do all sorts of other things that will be more efficacious. But the debate is not going to be whether or not climate change is happening or is happening because of what humans are doing. It's going to be what are the best tools to get us to a carbon neutral economy in the next 20 years. And of course, there's going to be also a lot of debate about mitigation strategies and so on, because we are we are having uh, the climate is getting warmer, uh, maybe not this winter in central Canada, but it is generally getting warmer. The science is saying that uh, Canadians want a science based policy and they want Canada to take the lead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Michael, this has been wonderful. I, I, I hate to see the clock reaching three o'clock and we have to fold up here. I, I just want to tell our, our audience before I, I say a final word of thank you. Uh, that on February the 15th, we'll be having a webinar uh, to mark Flag Day. Uh, February the 15th is flag, the annual Flag Day. We'll have um, Adam Vancouverden, uh, currently a member of parliament, a past uh, Olympian, and a couple of other people uh, involved in the Olympics and, and international sport to talk about what the flag means to them. And on February 23rd, we have a session on economic recovery. Uh, marking uh, Black History Month, we will be hearing from uh, a number of uh, senior executives, both in business and labor, who will be talking to us about uh, economic recovery for the country at large, as well as the advancement of black people. Uh, so we look forward uh, to having to welcome you then. The, the information about those will be coming to you in the next couple of days. Uh, Michael, thank you for, for this chat. Thank you for, well, first writing that column. And, and I just want to tell the audience, indeed, um, a lot of this discussion has been around the events of the past uh, 
12 days and the occupation in Ottawa and elsewhere. But um, we started this discussion uh, just after Michael's piece in the Globe Mail on January the 1st, um, which really we thought was very timely and ended up being a lot more timely than we thought. But you've you spent a lot of time in your life, Michael, examining these issues in Canada and the US. You're always very thoughtful and stimulating and uh, certainly meet my measure of what I would call a national treasure. So thank you so much for, for doing this, for, for you know spending your life doing this and, and for participating in this session today. Sincere thank you. No, it was a great pleasure, Andrew, and I'm honored to be a part of this session today. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thanks to our audience too.